Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. Um, we are uh, going to start a new series on, in two weeks, September 8th, called Made for More. Mike and I have been collaborating together on that, and uh, I'm excited about it. Um, if you've ever felt like, you know, is this all there is? Is there more I could be doing in my life? Uh, is there more I could be doing as a follower of Christ? Uh, that's what this uh, series is all about. Dr. Jill Bolt Taylor is a neuroscientist. She gave a TED Talk in which she talked about the brain. I'll let you just see a, a little bit of what she said. So this is a real human brain. This is the front of the brain, the back of the brain with the spinal cord hanging down. And this is how it would be positioned inside of my head. And when you look at the brain, it's obvious that the two cerebral cortices are completely separate from one another. For those of you who understand computers, our right hemisphere functions like a parallel processor, while our left hemisphere functions like a serial processor. The two hemispheres do communicate with one another through the corpus callosum, which is made up of some 300 million axonal fibers. But other than that, the two hemispheres are completely separate. All right, so what I wanted to do today is to come with an actual brain and uh, have it for you. But then I realized in order to pull that off, I'd have to go into OHSU late at night and kind of heist it. And I thought that'd be uh, too dangerous. So I thought I'd let Dr. Jill uh, show you what the brain looks like. Uh, we used to be taught that the brain you're born with is the brain you die with. Now we know that's not true. Um, our brain changes depending on what we look at, what we read, what we think about. The brain you walked in with today will be changed by the time you walk out this morning. Um, so, since the brain can change, it's very important what we think about. Uh, one of the most disciplined, uh, most important disciplines is to manage the way we think. Uh, whether you're a teenager or a senior citizen, single or married, one of the most important things you can do is program a positive mind. Uh, you face your greatest challenge every morning in the mirror. Uh, you are your greatest challenge. I have participated in every bad decision I have ever made. Uh, I'm a sucker for you might also like, or uh, other people that purchased this also purchased... Um, this is the 13th in a series of messages called Fixer Upper. We're talking about how do we fix up the way we think. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Philippi, and he talks about his joy 19 times. Uh, he says, if you're unhappy, it's usually a function of the way you think. Uh, if you want to experience the joy and happiness, you must think in right ways. Uh, if you're unhappy, it means you're thinking in wrong ways. Uh, unhappiness is usually a function of thinking negatively. And happiness is usually a function of thinking positively. Uh, stuck in a Roman jail where he's facing trial before Emperor Nero, who is learned that he can curry favor with the Roman citizens by killing Christians, of which Paul is the best known in the world, Paul programmed a positive mind. Now, I want to consider three questions today. Why do we have such difficulty maintaining a positive mind? What are we to think about to cultivate a positive mind? And how do we program a positive mind? So first, why do we have such difficulty maintaining a positive mind? When we come to Christ, we repent of our sins and give our lives to Him. We read in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. 
So we might mistakenly conclude that the battle has already been won and our old nature is completely eradicated. But then when something happens, we find how easily we can fall back into our old ways of thinking. Uh, it's because we have entered into a battle for the mind. Rather than looking on your conversion to Christ as winning the war, view it as entering the war. Who's the enemy? Peter says, read this with me, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, maybe you're not a follower of Christ. You're just checking him out. You don't believe that there's a devil. You're suspicious. The reason Christians believe in a devil is because Jesus talked about the devil more than anyone else in the Bible. When Jesus was raised from the dead, which is the best attested event in ancient history, that showed us that his claim to be the Son of God was true. And so we simply believe whatever he teaches. Peter says we enter into a war with a devil who wants to devour us. Paul says, read this with me, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Paul says our primary battle is with spiritual forces of evil. Notice the word schemes. It's the Greek word methodias, uh, from which we get our English word methods. Uh, it tells us the enemy has methods. He has schemes. He has a strategy. In 2 Corinthians 2, Paul says, In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. There we have the word schemes again, but Paul uses a different Greek word. Uh, Paul has a massive vocabulary. Here he uses the Greek word naima, which can be translated schemes or thoughts or mind. Paul says, we're not unaware of his mind-oriented schemes. We're fighting an unseen enemy whose target is the mind. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this world, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan's strategy for stopping the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to blind the minds of unbelievers so they can't even see their need for Christ. In chapter 10, he says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Military strategy in the first century involved walls and towers. Uh, walls were critical for the security of the city. A wall would be built before the city was built. It would keep out enemies and animals. They also had towers. So there you see a typical first century city with walls and towers. Uh, the uh, military leaders climbed up in the towers. From there they could see the enemy, where the enemy was coming, and so they could call their soldiers together to that part of the city to defend it. So first century military strategy involved breaking through the walls, then climbing the towers, and taking the military leaders of strategy. This is the strategy that Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 10.4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Those are the towers where the leaders would gather to wage the war. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. 
and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So the, the, the word Paul uses here, he has this uh, great vocabulary, is the Greek word hutsama, which means height or proud obstacle. This is a synonym for the towers. Before we know Christ, our enemies are enemy-held territory. Uh, when we commit our lives to Christ, Satan knows he will ultimately lose the battle, but he's not going to give it up without a fight. He wants to contain uh, retain control of our minds. This is why people who come to Christ late in life face such tremendous battles in their minds. Uh, their minds have, have thought in a certain way for so long, and Satan is not about to give it up easily. When Christ comes into a life, he overcomes the walls and the towers, the, the strongholds, our old ways of thinking. But when we're under pressure... We're find we're apt to go, oh, go back to our old ways of thinking. So if you had a problem with anger before you became a Christian, my guess is when you're under pressure, you still have a problem with anger. If your uh, uh, problem before you came to Christ was lust, my guess is in times of pressure, you still have impure thoughts. If you were jealous of other people before you became a believer, when somebody else succeeds, you d still deal with the problem of envy. If you were very critical of people before coming to know <clears throat> Jesus, my guess is you still have a problem of quickly condemning other people. Can you see why habits are so hard to break? They've been grooved in our minds. These habits are not broken unless we completely give ourselves, our minds, over to Christ. So can we change the way we think? This leads to our second question. <clears throat> what are we to think about to cultivate a positive mind? Now read this with me. This is our verse we're studying today. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble... Whatever is right, <clears throat> whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul tells us to think about good things. Uh, the Apostle Paul informs us that we are responsible for what we think about. You say, well, I can't help what I think. I can't help what I feel. Paul says, no, you're responsible for what you think about. Watch what you think. We are to feed our minds on good things. Philippians 4, 4, Paul tells us we're to rejoice in the Lord, even in difficult circumstances. In Philippians 4, 6, he says, rather than worry, we are to pray. But if we stop reading there, we won't get to Philippians 4, 8, which tells us we are to think about positive things rather than negative things. We chase out bad thoughts with good thoughts. Parents, if your son or daughter tends to go negative, quickly think on the dark side of things. Talk about how they can develop a positive mind. Paul suggests eight good things that we're to reflect on. We are to think about things which are true, noble, and right. Dr. Walter Calvert uh, reports that only 8% of things that people worry about are uh, matters for genuine concern. 92% of the things we worry about are imaginary. We just make them up in our minds. They never happen. Satan is a liar. He loves to get us thinking, about just imagining things that can go wrong and get all panicked about them. Our face... Our, our favorite national pastime is criticizing the national leadership of the other party. We seldom criticize the, the, the leadership of our own party. It's the other party. But the truth is, I've done more to undermine my success and progress than any 
political candidate ever elected to office. So, criticizing the leadership of the other party is not, not true. It's certainly not noble, and it's not even right. We're also to think about things that are pure. Paul's talking about moral purity. Uh, we're not to let our minds dwell on impure thoughts. We're not to look at pornography. We're not to daydream about someone who's not our spouse. Paul says we're also not to, we're also to think about what is lovely or admirable. Why waste our time thinking about other people's bad points? Think about their good characteristics. This is good marital advice. Don't focus on your mate's bad points. Focus on the good things. This is also good parenting advice. Catch your child doing something good rather than pouncing on them for doing something bad. Irma Bombeck writes about noticing the good things in children. In church the other Sunday, I was intent on a small child who was turning around, smiling at everyone. He wasn't gurgling, spitting, humming, kicking, tearing the hymnals, or rummaging through his mother's purse. He was just smiling. Finally, his mother jerked him about in a stage whisper that could be heard in a little theater off Broadway, said, stop that grinning. You're in church. With that, she slapped him and tears rolled down his cheeks. She added, that's better, and returned to her prayers. We sing, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, while our faces reflect the sadness of a person who has just buried a rich aunt who left everything to her pregnant hamster. <laughs> Suddenly I was angry. It occurred to me that the entire world is in tears, and if you're not, you better get with it. I wanted to take this little boy and tell him about my God. He's happy. He smiles. God had to have a sense of humor to create the likes of us. I wanted to tell him that he's an understanding God, one who understands little children who pick their noses in church because they're bored. He understands the man in the parking lot who reads the paper while his wife is inside in church. He even understands my shallow prayers when I pray, Lord, if you can't make me thin, then make my friends look fat. <laughs> I wanted to tell him I've taken a few lumps in my time for daring to smile at religion. By tradition, one wears faith and religion with the solemnity of a mourner, the gravity of a mask of tragedy, the dedication of a rotary badge. What a fool, I thought. Here was a woman sitting next to the only light left in our civilization, the only hope of our miracle, our only promise of infinity. And if he couldn't smile in church, where was there left to go? Don't get so serious that you forget to enjoy your children. And don't forget to laugh. Charles Swindoll, senior pastor at uh, Stonebriar Church in Frisco, Texas, he just stepped down and is now pastor emeritus. He received a letter from a woman. She says, you can stop preaching, but don't stop laughing. Yours is the only laughter that comes into our home. It's so important to laugh. Last Saturday, we had a fun time in our family. We celebrated uh, Erica's birthday and Erica's uh, sister's birthday, Drea's birthday. Uh, we adopted Drea from Romania and Erica from Vietnam, but they both have the same birthday. Um, and uh, even though they're 10 years apart. And uh, they both arrived at, at our home on the same day, December 7th, just under four months. So they have a lot in common. I think we have a little... Uh, video of them blowing out their uh, candles. There they are. Happy birthday, dear Erica Happy birthday to you. 18 and 29. You figure it out. You ready? Yeah. Okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So 
it was such a fun night. There were 11 of us, and, you know, we just sat around and told stories, and our kids told. They just that were so funny, and we laughed and laughed. We're here to think about things, Paul also says, that are excellent or praiseworthy. Uh, some people think it's their special gift uh, to, to, to complain and, 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 and criticize everything going on. Rather than looking for what we don't like, look for what is good. Why don't we try something after this service today? Before you leave, see how many people you can say something kind to, a compliment, or say something encouraging to. John Maxwell, the, the leadership guru, says he follows the 30-second rule. Every person he meets within 30 seconds to say something nice to them. The difference between being negative and positive is huge. A sign on the wall of a workout, Jim reads, a person who says he can't and a person who says he can are, strangely enough, usually both right. Whether we think negatively or positively will have a huge impact on our level of joy and happiness. If we're prone to be negative... If we're prone to uh, go to the dark side, can we change? That leads to our final question. How do we program a positive mind? So I thought about this for quite a while, and I had a list of things I could say. I decided to only speak about one thing. This one may surprise you. It may be something that you haven't thought about or haven't thought about lately. Memorize. The best way to root out negative or wrong thinking is to replace it with God's truth. I know of no better discipline to capture our minds for Christ than memorization of God's Word. David writes, How can a young man, a young person, stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart. Heart in in, in the Bible really means mind. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against God. Does Does it say God's word keeps us from sin? No, it says God's word hidden in our minds. When you're faced with a problem, you don't have time to, to look for a Bible or uh, to, you know, to look up a verse on your phone and, and find one that will... You need it hidden in your mind. Joshua 1.8, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. One of the best ways to meditate on God's principles is to have them memorized so that you have them with you when you have a need. The five weeks I was gone, I memorized 12 verses from Philippians and 73 Proverbs. Uh, Before you get impressed, these are verses I have memorized earlier in my life. I keep all kinds of uh, lists of verses that I memorized, and so I just basically was brushing up on them. First couple weeks, I I got them all in place in my mind. I I did them during what I call quiet time, the time when I spend with Christ uh, first thing in the morning. And then the last three weeks, I was rehearsing them and going over them, you know, kind of as I was driving or wherever I was. And I found them very helpful when I'd face a situation. One of those verses would come to mind. Doug and Debbie King Rittler uh, tell the true story of their four-year-old boy who had open-heart surgery. They were afraid. He was afraid. And so they kept talking to him about, God loves you. God will be with you. The pastor called and he said, memorize a verse. And so they memorized with their boy, Psalm 56.3. When I'm afraid, I will trust in God. Over and over again, they went over that verse with him. He went into the surgery and he was given a drug uh, that would paralyze him for 48 hours. They hadn't told him about it ahead of time because they hadn't known about it. He wouldn't be able to speak or open his eyes. 
And uh, the doctor said when he comes out of the anesthesia, he'll be violent. When he came out, he was mouthing the words, I love you, to his parents. And he was also saying this verse, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. The scripture had taken him through the surgery and given him strength. A scripture memorized helps us know God's promises in our time of need. If you've not made this a practice, maybe ever in your life, or it's something maybe you used to do, I want to encourage you this year to try memorizing. Each week in our journal, I put a verse. And so for this journal that's starting September 8th, I've put only what I call classic verses. By that I mean these verses would probably be on most people's top 500 lists for best verses in the Bible. And I've tried to keep them short, just two lines, three lines. I see one here that's mm, three and a half. Uh, If you think you can't memorize, it's not true. You can. Uh, Try memorizing that verse in the journal. When I go through the journal, it's the first thing I do each week. Um, uh, The other thing you could do is uh, if you have a particular problem you're dealing with, why don't you go and and look up a number of verses on that problem and memorize maybe a dozen verses, and they will help you uh, with that. Uh, This will really help your thinking this year. Uh, Read with me Philippians 4.9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says, you've heard me rejoice while I was in prison rather than be all upset about my circumstances. You've heard me say that rather than worry, you're to pray. But if you stop there at Philippians 4, 6 and don't read Philippians 4, 8, you won't learn how to program a positive mind. He says, you've seen me model this. Now you go and do the same. So look again at Joshua 1.8. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. Why? So that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. The purpose of learning a verse about God's love or mercy is so that you can hold his hand, the one that will never let you go. That was what Kent Brantley did. Kent Brantley was a medical missionary in Liberia in 2014. Do you remember the, uh, uh, the Ebola crisis five years ago? He was one of the main doctors at the center of that. He knew about Ebola, what a terrible virus it was. Thousands of people died. He knew the symptoms, severe fevers, nausea, and terrible diarrhea. And now he was experiencing the symptoms himself. So his fellow doctors uh, drew blood from him to test him, but it was going to take three days before they would get uh, the results of the test. So he quarantined himself in his house. His fellow staff could not come in. His wife was on the other side of the Atlantic. Their two kids. So he was all alone with his, his thoughts for three days. He turned to the Bible, and one of the verses he wrote in his journal is from Hebrews. The promise of entering his rest still stands. So let us never give up. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. He underlined the words, make every effort. And then he looked at another verse in Hebrews in that same chapter. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He underlined in confidence. He closed his journal and began to wait. Those three days were terrible. He was so sick. Kent's wife 
on the other side of the ocean, was in her hometown in Abilene, Texas. She and their two kids had gone to visit her parents. That Saturday, Kent got the results of the test. It was positive. He had Ebola. And so he called her, and she took her phone, and she went off to the bedroom so she could talk to him alone, and he got right to the point. He said, I tested positive. And she began to cry. He said, I don't feel so good. I'm feeling pretty tired. I'll call you back later. So his wife sat with her parents on her bed, and she, they cried. And she said, i got to get outside. And so she went outside, and she sat on a tree, the big branch of a tree, and she sat in it. She tried talking to God, and she, she didn't know what to say. Verses of a hymn came to her. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. She wrote in her journal, I thought my husband was going to die. I was in such pain. I was so afraid. The words of the hymn helped me through that time. Kent was transported back from Africa to Atlanta. They took a chance on him using an untested drug. As the hours went by, he began to get stronger. After several days, he was much stronger. And I don't know if you remember that day, but it seemed like the whole country rejoiced when he walked out of the Atlanta hospital. God's truth carried Kent and his wife through that difficult time. The mind is a is not a broad sea, but a narrow channel. You, know, you realize we can only think about one thing at a time? So if you let your mind be filled with fear and worry, that's what you'll get. But if you fill your mind with God's truth, you can drive out that negative thinking. And you can stop blaming other people for your unhappiness and your circumstances. Negative thinking only fills our minds by our permission. One of the most important things you can do is program a positive mind. So let's do that this week. Lord God, thank you for the words you inspired the Apostle Paul to write, to think about good things, not think about bad things and negative things. So we want to commit to doing that today. I want you to pray right now. <clears throat> Paul says, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are right, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You want to do that this week? Tell God you want to do that, that you don't want to go negative and worry. And if you've never given your life to Christ, that would be a thing you could do right now. Invite Him in to become Lord of your life. That's the first step in changing the way you think. You pray right now. Lord, we want to change the way we think this week. We all know how quick we are to go negative when something happens. And we want to fill our minds with your truth, positive truths about life. So we commit our, our thinking to you this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.